We must understand what can happen in any community plunged into deep economic and social depression by the removal of its biggest industry. That crisis brought into prominence a notorious crime situation that had plagued the area for years. Ohio's Mahoning Valley, located in the middle of the industrial corridor that runs from Pittsburgh to Cleveland. And in its heart, the once thriving mill towns of Struthers, Campbell, and Youngstown, the Mahoning Valley. Long known as Loyalty Union and Blue Collar. It's the kind of a place where one of the most popular recreational sports is a game of electronic poker at the corner bar. Winners are paid off four points to the dollar. This kind of gambling is illegal in the state of Ohio, but just part of the scenery in the valley. In the good years, the Mahoning Valley steel industry hummed around the clock. And factory hands here were amongst the highest paid workers in the world. A steel worker could leave the mill, and before he could make it up the hill with his pay envelope, there were temptations to spend it at the local poker parlor, at a dice game. But in the late 70s, the steel industry collapsed and with it that easy-going, hard-living prosperity. One out of five workers in this valley is out of a job today. The steel industry went away, but vice stayed behind. Jokingly, people say there were two industries in Mahoney Valley. One was steel and the other was organized crime. And now that steel's gone, the major employers organize crime. The mob runs the town. What we know is the mob. That's what runs uh, our total valley. Narcotics, uh, gambling, stolen cars, uh, prostitution, pornography. They're preying on our citizens, and it's killing our community. Former city councilman Bob Spencer tried to shut down prostitution and gambling in his neighborhood, but his efforts proved dangerous. We were asleep. It was 1, one or 1.30 in the morning, and one of the neighbor's children had come in late, and... She called us and said, your car is on fire. And we raced out into the living room, and the whole living room was orange with the glow of the car burning. Now, you say that all very calmly now, but I don't suppose you were very No, calm. I wasn't calm at all, especially when they said it was definitely a torch job. The FBI told the Spencers that the bombing was the work of organized crime, and the threats continued. Is this 788 Yes, it is. I burned your car once and a firebomb your house next time. We put bulletproof glass on our house to stop people from firebombing us. Uh, and frankly, we left it up there because uh, we thought we made some pretty serious enemies. I'm afraid if he's out late and being threatened once is enough of a lesson that you don't get over it. I think my children are afraid. And Evelyn Gordon won't forget what happened to her either. She used to run a little coffee shop a gathering spot for local political reformers. And Mrs. Gordon was helping collect signatures for a new city charter, which it was hoped would make politicians less vulnerable to corruption. But two nights before the filing deadline, she lay asleep in her apartment behind the restaurant. That's when a firebomb was tossed through the window. Within minutes, she lost home, business, everything in the world she had. She barely saved the petitions. It took me a long time to get over it, too. You know, I mean, like a lot of times I'd wake up through the night and. I can imagine I seen a fire, and sometimes I dreamt about me running down the street, you know. And if it was an experience, I wouldn't want it again. And former city councilman Bill Murphy knows how the mob operates. After falling under the influence of racketeers in the 1960s, he got out of politics. Today, he's a community activist. He says that fighting the system has its risks. When you try to reform things, uh, taking away from them, they must make an example of you for all people to see. Don't you try it. Over the years, people here have become almost accustomed to seeing their streets and neighborhoods shattered by mob violence. It all began in the 1950s, as two mob families competed for the area's lucrative vice industry. And in a little over a single decade, there were 82 bombing incidents. There were also 10 murders. In one case, a little boy was permanently crippled and his brother killed in a car bombing that took their father's life. It was the most violent period of mob warfare since Chicago of the 1930s. And because of this kind of open street fighting, the national press gave the area a new name, Bombtown USA. What was your reaction to the fact that a man could be bombed to death right here on Market Street? Well, I know that the rackets in this town are well known, and they, people expect it, I guess, sometimes, but not in a congested area where innocent people might be hurt. The way the FBI sees it, the two crime families have been at war for decades, one linked to Cleveland interests. Their local business has been in the hands of the Carabia brothers, represented by Charlie, Orley, 
and Ronnie Carabia. The other family from Pittsburgh, represented locally by the Naples boys. Twice imprisoned brother Joey is considered by federal authorities to this day a key figure in Mahoning Valley organized crime. After a 15-year truce between the Carabias and the Naples, warfare again broke out in the late 1970s. To date, two mob figures have disappeared, and there have been eight murders. In one murder attempt, a Youngstown mother of four was wounded. She'd been out that evening with an alleged hitman for the Carabia brothers. She remembers a dark driveway and two men in ski masks. It was like they moved in slow motion, and you didn't even hear them. They were just standing there, and they were pointing guns at us. And Joey yelled, oh, God, no, and they started shooting. And I was hit, and I didn't even realize it. This man was convicted on illegal gun charges stemming from that shooting and told the FBI that this convicted felon helped him do it. But the local prosecutor has yet to press charges. When do you think this sort of stuff is going to leave you? Probably, probably never, because this is the way Youngstown is. They love it this way in this town. The politicians make more money. Do you believe everybody is corrupt here? Three quarters of them, yeah. If you're honest, you won't make it here. How do you know that? It's the law of average in this town. The law of averages gave Jim Trafficant slim chances when he ran for sheriff back in 1980. He was a reform candidate with little going for him politically except his clean cut image. He'd been a star quarterback at the University of Pittsburgh and progressed from football hero to local hero as a drug counselor and a community activist. Honesty in politics was the issue in his campaign for sheriff. It's time to stop rubber stamping patronage in political deals. Together we can strike a blow against political bosses. Trafficant beat the local Democratic machine and took office promising to clean things up and stay independent. His performance was vigorous and well covered by the press. We're going to come down and knock your house apart. We're going to find that lab. Nothing seemed too far from the long arm of the big sheriff. Ever notify every law enforcement agency in the states surrounding Ohio? There were narcotics raids. You bring us in here? What's that? Yes. Yes, you did. Yeah. You realize that almost two of our agents were killed tonight? Almost killed tonight? No, I got two. On a deal that emanated from your dope? Weapons were seized. Illegal gambling machines were confiscated. I want to say one thing to Campbell. Campbell has become known as the gambler's town. Campbell is a very good town, an excellent town. Most people don't like what goes on here. And if Campbell doesn't straighten its own ship out, Campbell's going to be in for a lot of hell from the sheriff's department. To prove his point, sheriff trafficant arrested the mayor of Campbell, charging that he was running an illegal gambling operation in his grocery store. Hey, Rocky, what's this all about? You got a comment? Not a comment. Is it true you're running the numbers out of the dairy? No comment. The charges against the mayor were dropped, although his sister and brother-in-law pled guilty. But within 19 months of taking office, Sheriff Jim Trafficant, by then something of a law enforcement legend, was himself under arrest, indicted on racketeering and income tax charges. A federal bench warrant was issued today. Uh, Sheriff Trafficant surrendered to FBI agents and an IRS agent here. In Youngstown. The federal indictment charged that when he was a candidate, Jim Trafficant illegally accepted $163,000 from the Naples and Carabia crime families and failed to report it on his income tax return. Surprisingly, the case against Trafficant was the result of evidence obtained by the FBI from the Carabia family itself. Here's how that happened. Audio tapes were made of meetings at a Carabia residence between local public officials and members of the Carabia family. Charles Carabia disappeared in 1980, and when the FBI investigated that disappearance, the secret tapes of the meetings were discovered. And that's when it was learned that one of the officials who had met with the Carabia family was candidate Jim Trafficant. And what's more, the FBI learned that Trafficant had accepted those thousands of dollars in bribes from the mob. Trafficant admits taking the money, but says he gave it back. Ironically, the only person who could confirm this part of the story is Charles Carabia, who, as we said, is now missing and presumed dead. Trafficant now says it was all part of a master plan to entrap mobsters, a sting operation directed at organized crime. So your position is that you were trying to set them up? Absolutely, I did set them up. My intentions were honorable all the way through, and I learned how this time, town works. 
It's like the face of a one-eyed jack on a deck of playing cards. I've seen the other side of that one-eyed jack. They know I have. Well, I want to read to you from the transcript then. Fine. Whatever you guys do for the sheriff here is because I want you. I want to take care of Charlie and Orly and Ronnie because I made the deal with them and I'm loyal. Did you okay. say that? I don't have the specific tapes. Probably did. Well, here's the transcript. Sure, that's a transcript. There's no shock value in that transcript. Did you say it? More than likely I did. I can't say that I did. I don't remember three years ago. But I wouldn't certainly try and tell them, look, gentlemen, when I win, I'm going to shove it up your rectum because I'm going to bust you. I'd have them thinking that they are going to become the most powerful people in America to further my goals. One of the things I have to do to continue on what I'm doing is to further my goal, I have to have them trust me. That's the confidence game. That's what the mob usually plays with the politician. Why didn't you make a deal with the federal government instead of making a deal with the mob? How would I know who I was talking to? The point I'm trying to make is here is that I did not trust the FBI in Youngstown. A central part of Trafficant's defense were FBI informant reports naming this man, Stan Peterson, formerly in charge of the local FBI office, as a contact for mob figures. Your accusation seems to be that you think that the FBI is trying to kill law enforcement. I'm saying there are certain people in the FBI that transfer information to organized crime people, which protect and insulate them. But former federal prosecutor John Sopko disagrees. He says there were other options. The litmus test to any argument that the local FBI office or the local whatever office is corrupt is the fact that you can always go to other federal law enforcement agencies. You could always contact the U.S. Attorney's Office. You could always contact the Strike Force Office. Uh, you could always contact Washington. The sheriff's trial attracted considerable attention, yet surprisingly few people were shocked by the specter of political corruption that it raised. Don Hanai heads the local Democratic organization, and he told us that as long as money runs politics, he believes candidates will get it where they can. I'm sure he didn't do what hundreds of others have done, not only in this community, but across the United States. And uh, You mean in taking money from a mob figure, he didn't do anything that everybody doesn't do? Oh, <laughs> absolutely. That's exactly the point I'm trying to make. I'm sure that there are hundreds and hundreds of politicians who have taken money from mobsters. There's no question in my mind about it. And finally, after two months of trial and four days of deliberation, the jury reached a verdict. They found the sheriff not guilty, and Jim Trafficant walked away a free man. Any idea how the jury arrived at that verdict? Well, Hugh, the jury felt that there just were too many questions left unanswered by the prosecution, specifically questions about those audio tapes we mentioned. They seemed unreliable, and it had been established that they'd been edited. Now, with the trial behind him, the sheriff says he will renew his campaign against the mob. And at the same time, a new Valley Citizens League has been formed to continue the fight against crime and corruption. And, Hugh, I want to thank our ABC affiliate in Youngstown, WYTV, for invaluable help in putting this report together. All right. All right. Thank you, Cynthia. Later in the broadcast... <laughs> The music of the enormously successful duo Hall and Oates. Geraldo Rivera with their story. But next, I'll have a report on Leo Buscaglia, the man who reaches millions with a simple message, love. Right after this. Nothing's better? Nothing's better. 